This is the uh, OGM weekly call on Thursday, October 20th, 2022. Um, in Portland, my little weather app shows that as of like tomorrow, we fall off a cliff into winter and it goes from sunny, 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 tail end of summer, 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 summer to oops, it's going to be rainy now. <clears throat> well, that'll lower your fire risk. Uh, yeah, and the and for the last week, the the air outside has been really misty because there's some wildfires in Washington State pretty nearby. They're not blowing over us, but it's it's definitely messy air. So hopefully fires will put that out, and then we're off and running, replenishing the aquifers. Send it south. I know. If only there were a way. And, and apparently, like. There have been some big desperate plans to reroute major amounts of water from the Pacific Northwest all the way down to the Bay Area or LA uh, that have not come to fruition, but that's just a long way to move heavy stuff. It is. It is. We should just tow icebergs down, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, we used to sort of do that for ice, right? What What's prevented like a major desalination, like Israel-style um... desalination? What's prevented high-speed rail from happening between obvious destinations on the West Coast, for example? I don't know. I... <laughs> Forces of ownership and control of existing mechanisms of supply, yeah. perhaps? Yeah. <laughs> little, little things like that, yeah. Uh, now, desal at the volumes needed, you know, the average person needs 10 liters of water a day. That's just one person. <clears throat> the energy demands are unpalatable. It's it's a lot. Uh, now, if solar winds up being next to free, because we, we're getting like the cheapest solar installations now are like two cents per kilowatt hour, which is crazy. And apparently 10 cents per kilowatt hour beats coal. So your, your average coal fired plant is 10 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, so you get under that, you're good. And then you don't need to feed a solar collector any energy, no fuel. That's kind of cool. So if we get enough of those in enough places, then diesel gets super real. crazy real there is and a problem it, of brine though there's a lot of you know waste matter from this so i would right. say why don't we figure out how to make bricks out of the brine uh so that we're not putting it back in the ocean and changing the salinity or whatever like like make, let's let's make something out of the brine that they, they should fund a little competition like like napoleon funded the competition that led to margarine we could make pickles <laughs> <laughs> and turkeys co, -lo you know co locate what? pickle, pickle we, could call them, we could call them we could call them drought pickles <laughs> and have like pickle factories i like that a lot stacy are you going to contribute to the drought pickle idea no <laughs> no but I, but i did once i did once post somebody's idea on my facebook page similar to this hoping that one of my very intelligent friends would start a conversation and they just shut him right down. Ooh. And I, you know, I need to point that out. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the things is that it really, even just this really short discussion, it just shows how the solutions always cause another problem. Um, you know, Israel hasn't, it's completely dependent on electricity. You know, the water supplies, it's like we traded our, water so you know water problem for an electric problem and it's like okay well so you know and then it's like oh and then the brine and the waste and the it's just the the sort of it starts to give you this idea of how the techno utopianism it, it's not so it's not we'll just solve the next problem it's like okay it's far from straightforward. Yeah, I'm on a I'm on a, a mailing list with a bunch of geeks and scientists, and they've been having a little back and forth that arises every now and then about nuclear power. And Amory Lovins is a brilliant, brilliant expert on a bunch of stuff, but really very against nuclear at all levels. And there's a couple other people who are like, no, 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 nuclear is okay if this, if this, if this, if this, if this. And these are world class experts and they can't sort of sort it out to agree and they're each like well politely your arguments are full of shit and blah 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 um it's very very interesting yeah i mean on that particular problem i've heard a lot of arguments on both sides and that's actually i don't know if any of you guys saw this um thing that 
uh, it, it's actually a sense making thing. It was a sense making thing with Daniel Schmachtenberger, and uh, where he presented these three things on the stoa. And the first one, I'll find it in a second. The Thanks. first one was this uh, this sense making thing where it looked at all the arguments for and against. And nuclear power was one of the was the example that she gave on it. And you know, there's there's economic arguments, and then there's scientific arguments, and there are ecological arguments. And it turns out that she was able to. I think it was like 27 different perspectives people could have on this thing, and it was broken down. It was so interesting to to, to look at it. Um, one one of the arguments that you know that that I have been thinking about lately that struck struck me lately was like, well, this assumes that there'll always be people to maintain the waste facilities, and I'm like, ooh. Wow, I never like that's a very interesting assumption, right? Like we never think about, right? And and then all of a sudden you see what's going on in Ukraine, and it's like, oh, wait a second, there could be locations in the world where all of a sudden it becomes unfeasible to maintain the waste site. Who thought of that? Nobody thought of that. So I'll, I'll find that. I'm going to find that thing. Um, um, I just I just posted the only link to a Schmachtenberger Stoa uh, video that I have to the chat. Tell me if it's it, it, it might have landed close. So the issue of uh, people going to work at the waste sites, the general assumption of almost everybody is that people will show up for work. Uh, as things get dicey and people are thinking about protecting their families, going to work seems like a low priority. Yeah, and for the for the long term protection that Grace is talking about, you know, it, these sites need long term protection longer than there have been humans on the planet. And yeah, I'm I don't want to bet on that. Thinking here of the Long Now Foundation and their clock of the Long Now, the, which I find puzzling, but the whole idea of which is to to focus our thoughts on, hey, what if we needed a project that had to stay around for ten thousand plus years? uh and you know humans in their current social aggregations haven't been around quite that long we are nowhere near the longevity of dinosaurs um some decades ago joanna macy and a bunch of other people did something called the nuclear guardian project uh which was trying to create almost a culture of taboo like you know what what would be the signs and symbols and procedures and cultural uh you know Bene Gesserit style injections you would need to do to ensure that these things could be safe for hundreds of thousands of years. Just nuclear consider guardian, nuclear guardian project. Just consider the change in English from Chaucerian English to today. If mm -hmm. I started speaking Chaucerian, how many of you would speak would understand me? And we've got to take enormously technical stuff and put it in a language that can be understood for thousands and thousands of years as culture and language change. I mean, it's a it's a dimension not a lot of people think about when we start talking about how to handle nuclear waste. Sometimes and you, I think you are speaking Chaucer. We could burn it on a floppy <laughs> disk too. We'll burn it onto a floppy disk so they can. I, I have a floppy disk. Well, I have some cassettes. <laughs> can we do a mixtape? Can we just do? A, can we do a mixtape? I like mixtapes. Uh, so, so we might find some solutions to these problems if only we lived in a post-capitalist society. <laughs> nice segue, Jerry. Was awesome. Was that good? Did I pick that, that up? Was, yeah, that was good. Tweak it over. Um, and, and today is a topic call, and I'm excited about our topic. And I'm going to lean on Ken a bit because Ken recommended some choreography for our conversations in the sense of breaking up into subgroups uh, to work around questions. Uh, just for uh, grins, let me do a quick uh, screen share for a sec. <clears throat> so Ken, um, I took sort of, uh, ba -da -ba -da -ba -da. here's here's uh, here's your post on the Plex. Here's Here are all the issues that I've seen of Pete's Plex dispatch. Uh, here is the October 5 version. Here is my copy of your essay down here. You can read the whole thing. And then I actually took and parsed out uh, the questions you asked in there. Um, so, so these are the questions that are in the in the tail end of your post there, which are lovely questions to consider. And I don't know if you want us to break up and discuss some of these questions. That might be a a, a way to do this, but I'm going to leave that to you. Uh, but I'm going I'm to share the link out to um, this call in the chat right now, so that anybody who feels like it can sort of wander around there. Now, what I didn't do yet is link each of your questions up to the contexts that it belongs to, which 
I know, you know, it, were we to actually go deeper into that and start focusing on them or were my breakout focusing on four of those questions, I would then do that, you know, onward from there. Uh, and as, as, as always sort of my assumption, but we don't practically do this very much. Um, if anybody else is note taking or mapping or doing anything around any of our calls, send those links to me and I will include them when I post back to the to the, the OGM Town Square channel. I will include them in my brain as, uh, as part of the map and so on and so forth. Let's let's do more of using the tool, the sense making tools that we each like uh, to make sense together. Grace. My question is, can you say what you mean by co post capitalist? Because that's like, uh, it's okay. like, I don't even know what, I, I don't know what capitalism is. Like, what are you referring to? It's a very good question. Ken, do you want to start there? Sure. Hello, everybody. Um, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you might be. Um, I don't think, oh, Grace, it's probably, it's getting close to evening for you. So good evening to you. Um, so... In the nutmeg's curse, um, there's a line that says it's harder to imagine the end of capitalism than it is to imagine the end of the world. And I read that just rang for me really true. Like there's so much stuff right now about the end of the world and all these endings and extinction events and doom and gloom. And it's like, wow. And and I'm like, you know, capitalism seems to be driving in many ways many of the um, uh, big challenges that we're seeing. And so I'm thinking, well, if we could get past capitalism and get past a post-apocalyptic vision of the world and start to imagine a flourishing world where, you know, everyone's needs are met, um, where in the dawn of everything, they talked about the woodland Indians of the Northeast um, uh, when the Europeans arrived, where everybody had the means to an autonomous life, but everybody else had private property. So the women owned the land. Uh, and farmed it, but they shared the bounty. And the men owned all their own implements for hunting, but they shared the bounty of the hunt. And so everybody had their needs met. And then there was a way of building up so you could have an autonomous life that um, didn't rely on destroying the world around you. So to me, that's a post-capitalist world. How do we create an autonomous life for everybody? We don't have to destroy the planet's uh, life support in order to make that happen. That's my biggest, broadest um, feature of that. Doug. Ken, Ken, that sounds like that was a pre-capitalist world. It was my thought and, exactly in the chat. And I, I think we can um, there, there may be some wisdom in going back and recovering elements from the pre-capitalist world, coupled with what we now have um, to make a post-capitalist world. Um, love that. And I think this this notion of turning over the soil on what is capitalism is a really nice uh, way to walk into this whole topic. Doug. So I think the problem is not capital. Uh, my view is that capital is the surplus produced by whatever economic system you have. The problem we have is the ownership. Who owns the surplus? And that leads them to be the people who get to make decisions about society. Uh, capital begins uh, in Greece and Rome with a new head of capital, uh, cattle, uh, capital, cap for head. Uh, cattle was the sign of wealth. And the issue that's very interesting is Plato and Aristotle talk about, okay, if a well-managed society produces a surplus, what should we do with a surplus? And their view was, okay, surplus would be silly to buy new things. It should be used for creating free time for leisure and politics. When that model moved into early Christianity, it became that the uh, eco in economics was the uh, was God's estate, and our job was to manage the surplus produced there uh, for prayer and contemplation. Mm -hmm. So there is a history of uh, what should be done with surplus. But to get back to my first point, the problem I don't think is capital, because capital is just the surplus produced by a society. And any society is going to do that. The problem is when capital moves into an ownership regime, that's, that means that some people own capital and some people do not. And so oh, the word ownership is really important here. And I think a lot of us uh, would, would vehemently agree that there's something awry with ownership um, and ownership and control of ownership and so forth. So let's dive there a little bit. Uh, Mike, then Gil. I, I love the fact we're talking about words, although I'm a physicist. Um, 
I think it's unfortunate that we call the system capitalism because it does put the focus on the money. Um, the fact is you really need to talk about a political economy. You need to talk about the power. Sometimes you can use power to get money and sometimes you use money to get power. And then now we've got this world of overabundance of data, information, ideas, and the computing power and network power to do something powerful with them. And so if we're going to have a post-capitalist society, this is a great time to start it. And, and we're seeing these utopian visions of uh, a digital economy where people can you know, kind of design their own job and work from where they want. I mean, these were things we talked about in the 90s, but we didn't have the capabilities and we didn't have the socialization. People hadn't gotten used to the idea that you weren't going to get a job and work there for five years or 40 years. But now, you know, the gig economy could become the post-capitalist economy because we now have these ways to take ideas and take data and, and create new brand new services for next to nothing. There's a rear guard action going on. There's a lot of people with a lot of power and a lot of employees who are fighting like hell against anybody who challenges their obsolete business models. But uh, I, 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 I haven't seen the good vision for what 2040 could look like if we fully utilized the platforms and the data that we have. But I know it's out there. And I think we'll, we'll just do it piece by piece. And it, it'll probably be somebody in Kenya who comes up with one piece of it. They, they've already discovered mobile money. And then it'll be somebody else in India who does something magic with farming. And maybe something else will happen with energy and uh, and water, and we'll start getting the key inputs into this new economy provided in new ways that don't involve massive utilities and, and the like. I mean, I, 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 I just wish that the people who wrote the fantasies about this decentralized world actually knew some basic economics and understood politics. Um, if we can find the right core group of people who could put together all those pieces, I think there is a, a, a vision that actually would resonate with 60, 70, even 80 percent of people in Europe and even a majority of people in the U.S. So I, 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 I apologize. I do have to leave in 10 minutes, but I, I, I am desperate for that vision. So if anybody sees something that the only thing that I think we talked last time about Bildung and um I went and picked up that book and I'm working my way through that. And the, the idea of libertyism, mm -hmm. li libertism. And, and again, it's, it's a, a world where we're all empowered to do some of the things that I was just talking about. Um, so Ken and Grace are trying gently to steer us back into a, a look forward instead of a look backward. Um, Gil, you have your hand up. If you would like to head in that direction, you're welcome to it. Otherwise, I'd love to skip directly to Ken and have him start sort of uh, choreographing us into this. Yeah, let me do it real quick. Then I'm going to have to go out and uh, take the call while walking to a um, medical appointment. Um, um, Mike, I think the visions have been out there. Um, they're not in, you know, they're not widespread because it's not convenient for the folks on the media to have them be widespread. But, you know, if you haven't seen the work of Murray Bookchin, I would point you there. Um, uh, Murray. Huh? Go oh, Murray. Murray. Go oh, Murray. Yeah, Murray, um, uh, who writes really evocative. Uh, um, um, he was taken as kind of the source documents for the Rohingya community in, in, uh, of, of the Kurds uh, who have built or attempted to build the kind of uh, vision on the ground, Mike, that you're talking about, now, not not treated very well by um, Saddam Hussein and, and the Americans and various others. But there, there are examples and stories, and there's lots of visioning out there. I think one of the challenges we talk about capitalism is that it's it's not just a matter of geek economy and decentral decentralized technology, but a, a world that puts capital at the center of the game. Uh, in fact, puts financial capital at the center of the game. Chauncey Bell talks about the fact, and many people talk about the financialization of everything. That capital becomes the pivot point and the measure of everything. Um, 
Uh, we conflate capitalism with business and with markets. Uh, there were markets long before there was capitalism. Uh, human economic activity long before, you know, and, and Ken talked about that a moment ago. So I think, uh, and I don't know if this is a part of the look backward or the look forward, Jer, but the, um, as I think about it, uh, lots of efforts to reform capitalism don't get at the structural defects that are inherent uh, in that economic system. Which um, is part of the problem is that, and part of the reason why we end up talking about what is capitalism a whole bunch is-, is Yeah, that... and we talk about, you know, um, ethical <clears throat> capitalism, environmental capitalism, stakeholder capitalism- Conscious capitalism. Conscious capitalism and so forth. And um, uh, I, my short list has six structural defects uh, built into the game that we have to address if we're gonna get to post-capitalist. Uh, uh, you know, and can I, can I just rattle them off real quick? Uh, go quickly. Okay. Um, and I can later post up about this accumulation without limit. Oh, yes, you've said that before. Uh, extraction without reciprocity. Alienation without care. Abstraction without ground. Uh, generation without regeneration. Maybe that one's redundant. And privatization without solidarity. Which I put in my brain some time ago. Um... There you go. In okay. 2020, in 20, June 2021 call, you mentioned yeah. those, and I added them then. Okay, uh, which reminds me, I need to actually finish the piece of writing on this. Uh, How about that? Okay, so I'm going to go. I'm going to go off video. I'll be uh, listening, and thank you all. Awesome, anyway. thank you. Can, can you take your bot's hand down? I will. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and before I turn the con to Ken Grace, did you want to add something that will help us steer here? Uh, no, this is going great. This is going swimmingly. Excellent. Ken? So framing. I'm inviting us to step into an imaginal space, not a problem-solving space. I believe if you saw my article on the Plex uh, yesterday, or the today, whenever it came, today, I guess, um, the, the problem with problems is we get into trying to solve problems. And I think that is a downstream move, not an upstream move. We want to start with uh, what would a world that's post-capitalist look like? What if everyone's, what if the children of all species for all time had everything they need to live a good life? That's not a problem to be solved. That's a, that's a concern to be lived into. That is a, that is a BHAG to be, you know, explored. And so I don't want anyone to try and come up with the vision today. I don't want anybody to try to come up with the problems that you know, we're going to solve this. I just would like us to step into, let's imagine. And I just found this article yesterday on speculative futures. And, and somebody, um, uh, there's an artist in front of a vacant lot in a city who put all these labels that said, I wish this was. And people were coming along and they're, they're writing, I wish this was a garden. I wish this was a park. I wish this was, you know, a dare care center. And it's like, get into the, I wish, I, I, I wish we were in this imaginal space. We don't have to solve any problems here because first by generating a whole bunch of ideas, we might actually find some that we can work on. But today is not about working on ideas. Today is about generating ideas. Does that make sense to everybody? Any questions? Questions on that? Okay. Sounds good to me. You can you can argue with the artist. Um, Grace, did you have something else you want to say? Your hand's still up. Oh, uh, I was in line to talk about this vision that we're talking about. So I don't know if I'm next or not. Uh, no, what we're going to do is we're actually going to, because it's so awkward to try and coordinate this with 16 people. I'm going to ask Jerry to create four breakout rooms and we'll go into small rooms for about 20 minutes each and then we'll shift to a different room with new people and then we'll come back into plenary. So we'll do two rounds of that and just, you know, there's a list of questions that I started um, in the post that Jerry has linked in his email. So you can look at those, you can add your own questions, say, I'd like to talk about this question, or here's my idea, or here's my wish, my desire. Um, so the idea is to do two rounds of about 20 minutes each and come back to plenary and see what we're learning. I'm ready to click on the breakouts whenever you I say. knew you would be. You're just an amazing guy, Jerry. Thank you so much. So any questions before we go into <clears throat> breakouts? And welcome uh, to Mark. What is our assignment in the breakouts? Your assignment in the breakouts is to look at the questions that I have posed or pose your own and talk about my vision of a post-capitalist world is one where the children of all species for all time have everything they need to live a, a, a great life. 
that could be a start. Right? Could you paste that in the chat so that we've got that as a prompt? Sure. <clears throat> Thank you. Just because what is, we'll, I guess we'll, the, the question I want to ask, I'm sure. question I want to ask is what is your vision of a post-capitalist world? And no one's going to make you wrong for it. Whatever you say, that's going to be your vision. And we're going to look for, I can really relate to that. Thank you. Ken? Yes. Um, <clears throat> might be more imaginal if it's what's your vision of a world. Because you can parse it any way you want. Ties me down to something. That you can, you can parse it any way you want. Whatever works for you. I'm just suggesting starting points. It's not adhere to this question. Ask whatever you want. I'm saying step into it. We don't exercise our imaginations enough. We're always talking about what we know. We don't know, we don't know how to create a post-capital. We have to imagine it first before we can figure it out. So I'm asking you to, to exercise your imagination here. Sounds great. Um, Doug, so I want to make a comment before we go in. And Please. that is the difficulty in this group of following any logic so I'm proposing that capital is the wrong target. You cannot have a society without capital. What you can have is a society with a different form of ownership. And ownership is the real problem. I disagree. Oh. Let's get into our breakup rooms and figure yeah. it out. Yay! Let's, let's go. Let's just go. <clears throat> Thanks, Doug. Let's go into breakouts. Here we go.
Grace, looks like you have some time. I was just going to comment that a lot of this, both what you said and what Pete says, just it both, it's sort of pointed at an integrated life, like that we're not separate from one another, we're not separate from the planet, we're not separate from the, you know, like even thinking of the planet as like our mother or as our child, it's like, well, those are kind of just part of you, right? They're just an extension of you. And uh, here I am with my coffee, which is like, very soon it's not going to be my coffee, it'll be me. I think one way of expressing that for me is what I just typed in the chat, which is I wish we recognized our interdependence with each other, with animals, with the planet. Uh, and and I'll add something to that that might color it too much, but sort of the sacred nature of those relationships. And I use the word sacred very hesitantly there, but that, but that those bonds and relations and connections and dependencies are just what everything's made of. They're they're like royally important and we need to tend to them with care. And and part of the reason I'm really happy that the word consumer bothered me 30 years ago when I started following it is that I think the word consumer and the consumerization of our lives is a piece of what drove us apart from each other and what made us give up responsibility for the commons and for uh, society and all those kinds of things. And we are currently at a nadir, <clears throat> not Ralph, uh, of that set of emotions and possibly tipping even further down if this thing spirals out of control. Ken, you've got the con. Um, quick show of hands. How many people found that an easy conversation? Yeah? How many people found it kind of hard to step out of the, well, that won't work because of this? That was definitely part of, of our conversation. Um, it's very challenging to step outside. Our, our Mark, please go ahead. Oh, I'm just raising my hand. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, was, I thought you wanted to speak to us. Welcome. Um, is this part of an exercise regime, Mark? <laughs> um, yeah. Whoops, lower hand. Okay, good. Um, all right, so let's do another round. Can you hit recreate on the breakout room so we end up with different people? And we'll do another 20 minutes and we'll come back here. Thanks, Wendy. Good to see you. Um, and we'll, uh, and maybe since there's fewer people, maybe do fewer rooms. Three, I don't know. Uh, three rooms? Yeah, three rooms of four will be fine because cool. Gil's actually here twice because of his note taking thing. All right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> cool. I'm sending us back into rooms. And 20 minutes, and we'll come back and, and check in with each other. Perfect.
And we're sort of back. There Ken we go. Ken's gone. <laughs> Ken's, now, Ken. Ken's still in the breakout. So <laughs> okay. you have 60 seconds till you get pushed out of the breakout. So a bunch of people are still in other rooms. Okay. <clears throat> Room one is still hot. I hit the leave breakout by mistake when we still were. Ah. And I can't get back, but oh well. you couldn't find your way back in? Not to the breakout. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't After... see you. I didn't see you drifting uh, in the in the breakout thing. It didn't tell me that there was somebody unassigned. No, 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 no. What I'm no, saying. No, just the last few minutes. Just the last few seconds. You're talking about. What I'm saying is that um, when the option to leave the breakout um, came up, um, we were still talking, and I hit the button to leave ah. the breakout mistake, and I couldn't get back to the breakout. Saying, gotcha. Oop, "Sorry, I left the breakout too early." Apology noted. And I was actually answering a question of Mark's in the middle of that. So the answer is Hanlon's razor is never assume malice when ignorance will do for an excuse or something close to that. Okay, how was that for people? I would love to hear how your conversations went. Who'd like to who'd like to share? Doug, you're muted. The, the the main thought I had, which goes back to your question, is that people still, when they talk about wishes, it's very abstract. It's very hard to envision what kind of world it actually looks like. What's the texture that could be caught, for example, on a video camera of what this is like? Uh, and so it kind of floats. And the floating then keeps the the conceptual world and the natural world separate. And Doug, this is a really, really common problem with anybody trying to describe anything. And one of the things I often push people to do is offer texture and say, describe some very specific act or thing that we're familiar with that would be different in the future that you're proposing or the scenario you're proposing. And it's kind of hard for people. And um, I think it's a very useful exercise. Maybe at some point we do that as an exercise to just like figure out what texture means and how to describe texture because many of us are very intellectual and in our heads all the time. And everything that comes out of our mouths is this kind of like floating in the ether and makes a lot of sense to us, but doesn't get grounded in other people's perceptions because it's missing texture. So am I trying to make it more visual? was to suggest that the wish is that we would move where we live and where we garden closer together. Which you can picture because it's an urban design idea. Or a suburban or a rural. Exactly. Well, yeah, urban planning, land use management, whatever uh, whatever the right category is. Um, Mark, you your hand was up and then down and then up. So Mark first, then Gil. So I was asked this question last night. Um, at the Internet Archive, because you know, my job is one I actually don't like very much. It's um, kind of janitor of the of the website and maintenance worker, um, rather than you know, doing a lot of the creative stuff. Um, because the new kids knew all, know all the um, new JavaScript stuff, and I am often stuck doing PHP maintenance work. Um, and somebody asked, you know, with all kindness. You know what would the job you like feel like and i looked at the clock and said well you know this is going to take a lot of time to envision an answer we don't have you know two hours to do this or we're probably you know in a 15 minute conversation at the most and there are five other people here and you know i just can't answer that um, i can't do that kind of vision um off the cuff with any kind of um mm, real um juice to that vision could you have asked for some time to think about it and then come back in a different setting and and then express it um i'm gonna have to do that yes yeah. um because but... sometimes you, sometimes you've got to like turn it over if it's a really yeah. great question you need some time yeah, I mean, he asked me, you know, what would your perfect day look like? It's a great question. 
uh, it's common envisioning and envisioning um but i think you have to give it a lot more time than five minutes um 30 sec 30 second story that i've told long ago in ogm but uh, long ago i attended a meeting about a uh, quaker process of meeting for business how do quakers make decisions <clears throat> and we had a guy standing in front of the room who was lovely and at one point he asked us a question and we all kind of leaned forward and like oh like arnold horshack and he was like let's go into silence for three minutes with this and i was like my little inner voice was like, how the hell did I get to be 30 years old? And nobody has ever <clears throat> said, let's go into silence for a little while and consider our answers rather than race to answer this thing. And I, like a little light bulb went off in my head about my educational career to that point. Uh, Gil and Grace, uh, unless Ken, you want to, to steer instead. Yeah, oh, um, go. I'll talk later. Go Gil. Yeah, I, 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 I like these last few comments. I think the the setting, the, a lot of people have said it's difficult to vision, and I think this, the setting matters a lot. And how I vision around a Zoom screen versus around a table with you or around, you know, around a living room with you all or in a hot tub with you all uh, or you know at a meditation retreat with you all or coming together after two days of solitude you know, in the wilderness are all really different conversations and access different aspects of my imagination. Um, and we are, we're trying, Ken's, in, Ken's inviting us into a very vast exercise and we're using a very constrained form of conversation to get us there. Um, I'm not criticizing it, I'm just observing. Uh, that's it. Thanks, Gil. Um, Grace? Yeah, so I found it, yeah, very strange conversation, mostly because I have this convers like I've been in this conversation for the last year or two or three or what, and like it's like, oh, I'm going to do that again. Um, and so I found that a bit strained. Um, and I do agree with Gil about the about the format. But one thing that I thought was great that came out of it was kind of a reframing of what does a post capitalist world mean? which came out both in the first conversation and the other. And so like, you, you know, on the one hand, we could think of post-capitalist as, oh, you know, we caused all this destruction. But on the other hand, it's like we created all this cool stuff. And so reframing it to be, hey, um, capitalism created all these technologies and all these tools and all this stuff. And there were some collateral damage, uh, which we, you know, we're going to have to repair. But basically a post-capitalist world is the world in which we've got all the stuff now what do we do with it and and i think that framing is very useful for me personally as like we built stuff what do we do with it um and grace i i, I really love that reframing and that helped me a lot when you said it um i'm puzzled because you've been chewing on this for a very long time and i would think that when this kind of conversation comes up you'd be like i have a little utility toolkit full of things to light people's heads up with of scenarios or possibilities or or things that this new world could be like so 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 um but you just expressed sort of regret and like man that was rough and and and, and, and i'm a little puzzled because you've been in the trenches doing this for for a really long time and and i don't know maybe that's a well, reframing yeah but i think that's right but it's like okay you've been in the trenches doing this for a long time let's start back at zero I actually was in a conversation with that, like a group last night that was exactly that. They had hired somebody to write up like their vision for the future. And this person ran across my white paper and they're like, this is it. Oh. I found it. He's like, I found it. And so he told them about it. And they're exactly, almost exactly where I was about six years ago in their thinking. And so he had me come in and present to them. And it was like talking, like it was like, I'm talking a different language. And it was so frustrating. And so I'm kind of referring to that. I really do want to hear other people's ideas. And I don't want to come into a brainstorming session saying, I've thought about it for 10 years. Let me tell you how, like, that's the worst way to come into a brainstorming session. It's horrible. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I run into people who've actually marinated in, in difficult things for a long time. And I just want to hear straight from them 
the insights they got. I don't mind. I don't think that's a terrible way to enter a conversation at all. I think that somebody who who's really, really sat with something is super valuable. Right, but not for a brainstorming session because they're a fucking know-it-all. Nobody needs that. Is the difference between sharing your hard-won knowledge and being a know-it-all, isn't there? And, and if you treat them as a know-it-all, <laughs> that's like a chilling effect on somebody who's actually like got a lot to say. Does that make sense? Yeah, Chris? I understand. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I'm trying to take advantage of the hard work that you and, and people like you have done and, and respect like it and honor it and like drag it in so that we can like build more stuff with it. But I don't I'd feel like to observe that there's a difference. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it depends on what the goal of the brainstorming is. Is the brainstorming a way to uh, raise group awareness or is it a beeline towards the right answer? And, and there's lots of other what, things the brainstorming could be accomplishing, right. but those are two different things and you would, you would listen to an expert differently in each of those. Agreed. Thanks, Pete. Uh, yeah. Michael, then Mark. This, this is not what I was going to say, but just a comment on what Pete was saying and, and you two before um, that, you know, is the brainstorming for that spark, for that, you know, lightning in the storm of ideas never uttered before, never conceived of before, where hearing the same ideas that somebody's been thinking for a long time um, is, is making that possibility not as great. So uh, uh, I was going to say in response to, to Grace's thought about um, the, the post-capitalist um, world, something that kind of came up in, in, in both of the conversations we were having about um, that are the, are the, the incentives that we now think of as, you know, Grace, you were saying capitalism gave us this, capitalism gave us that. Well, did capitalism give us that? Would those things that that the my desire to do what I'm best at um, and somebody else's desire, you know, to to make the art, to, to you know, invent the thing, is it is it really driven by capitalism? And certainly, it's 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 kind of. Uh, you know, the, the thing, the making art doesn't make you as much money as the inventing the post-it, you know, does, and, and it sort of skews things, but the, the person who was working on making adhesives and resulted in the post-it, um, like, that was their thing. And if, if you were in a situation where wasn't reflected in your income, but reflected in your ability to do the thing you love to do and produce, either produce a surplus of, of something that you like to make or produce um, knowledge, wisdom, invention that served a lot of people and you got the sort of glory and gratification of serving those people. I don't know if that stuff would go away in a, in a, in a place where you know, we were all getting everything we needed, getting, you know, whether, whether it's UBI or just this sort of thing of like, you know, I get up in the morning, I do the thing that some of the thing that I'm really good at, that, you know, I get the gratification of seeing people enjoy some of the thing that's just fun for me, because that's what I like to do, and, and keeps me healthy and sane. And other people, provide stuff that that I get and need um, alongside having their fun and it's all good I mean it's you know it's 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 more of a tribal you know it, it's 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 a way of being that's seen in in some indigenous societies but it's seen in capitalist societies just like kind of having its incentives tweaked in often unhealthy ways if that makes sense. 
I will talk about unhealthy ways right now. Um, so I'm very open about having a problem with um, having too much stuff. And when I try to get rid of stuff, it takes a heck of a lot of energy. Um, my parents were both poor, um, you know, as children, and they hang on to stuff. My mother and father were hoarders. And so I've got too much stuff and too little time to get rid of it. And going to zero is what you know, somebody described, asked when I just described this problem yesterday, have you considered arson? So um, I've, I've certainly considered arson in my parents' house as I was growing up. Um, it's just like, yeah, let's, you know, burn the motherfucker down. Um, and starting from zero would be a catastrophe um, because we're historical creatures. Um, and I ask for help from people to come every Saturday and help me get rid of stuff. Um, and, um, you know, it's this, you know, this is a problem where people don't often solve it on their own. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, it's, it's a problem for me that came from, you know, it really made me think about intergenerate intergenerational trauma. Easy for you to say. Yeah. Um, but, um, because I kind of rejected that idea until I really started thinking about yeah yeah mom and dad fucked me up you know and it wasn't there you know it wasn't their intent to do mm -hmm. so right um but you know mm -hmm. i would love to have one tenth of the belongings that i have and was happiest in my life when i lived out of the books like man with one a thousandth of the things that i have um but now i have things and do i just burn them or find homes for them. Um, uh, anyway, I'll let Michael or, or Ken talk. I was, uh, we're, we're near the end of our time. Uh, in, in Mouse, I was very struck when Art Spiegelman <clears throat> describes his father um, hoarding tinfoil, trying to return a half-eaten box of cereal to the market for a refund, things like that, as a Holocaust survivor. Um, who had been through a period of deep trauma where he had nothing. And so every every little scrap was meaningful and that was just ingrained in, in his being at that point. Um, we're near the end of our time. I'm going to pass the floor back to Ken to see what he'd like to do. Yeah, and so Michael, I was going to kind of close out. So if you got something quick. Michael wants uh, to talk I, about I just, waste, which is a great topic. Like, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I would love to devote maybe maybe it's a subject for the next time we do a topic based thing of like the stuff that we accumulate and making it making it not have been a waste that we accumulated it um and and the dynamics around that so i'll leave it there well i want to thank everybody for um playing in my sandbox today um i i really enjoyed the opportunity to go deeper with a few folks in these uh, breakout rooms. So I appreciate that. Um, something I learned is I would, I guess next time I wouldn't frame it as post-capitalism. I think that caused a lot of problems for people, um, but rather post-apocalyptic because it feels like the dominant narrative in the media right now is one of doom and gloom and apocalypse and impending nuclear war and, you know, drought and floods and fires. And, and it's like, yeah, those are all real. But if we don't have a positive vision of the future to work towards, we're going to have a hard time creating that that future. So that's part of the impetus for, for me to to start this call. And um, I really, I, I think issues of power came up. And um, I think it's just plain difficult because we're not often asked, we're, we're often asked to solve problems, but not often asked to say, if you could, if you had a magic wand, what would you create, right? So. Personally, for me, I found the, the call extremely illuminating, and I learned things that I wouldn't expect to learn. I, I got pushback uh, that I wasn't expecting. I'm, I welcome it all. Uh, it's been it's been terrific. How about disapocalyptic? Yeah, okay, Michael. Uh, <laughs> would that be a DYS apocalyptic or DIS um, or DS DISS? Uh, Just avoiding uh, the post-apocalyptic implies that we have to go through it to get yeah. there. Exactly. Um, so a non-apocalyptic world. Um, but I, I just wanted to 
try to get us thinking there. And, you know, it, I totally agree. It would be so awesome if we could be together, if we could, if we could actually do this in nature, like where it could take a break and go walk in the woods and come back and, you know, do it over a couple of days and, um, and have ways of, of tracking stuff, you know, whiteboards and mural paper and, you know, um, but I thought this was a really good start. And I just, very, very thankful for the folks who showed up today. Even if you didn't necessarily like it, thank you for playing along. And Ken, I want to thank you for suggesting the topic and for leading us into it. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, lots of good stuff showed up in my head uh, through this conversation. So thank you. Anyone else want to put a bow on this? All right. Let's, yeah, um, I'll, I'll close with a poem. Sounds this, great. This is from memory. This I may have recited this before. This is William Stafford, one of my favorite poets. It's called Ultimate Problems. In the Aztec design, God is in the little pea that is rolling out of the bottom of the picture, and the rest extends all the bleaker because God has gone away. In the white man's design, there is no pea. God is everywhere, but hard to see. The Aztec frowns at this. How do you know that he's everywhere? And how did he get out of the pea? That's lovely. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Everybody. <clears throat> All right, bye. bye.